Hi everyone, Mary here, and we're going to talk about latent heat. Now, this graph is a graph of temperature on the y-axis versus added heat through time on the x-axis. Um, what's going on is this. Imagine that we took a big, big beaker, and we went outside and we got a big beaker of snow, container of snow, and we put it on a nice, steady heat source, and we put a thermometer in that bucket of snow, and we took its temperature every 30 seconds, and then every 30 seconds, we plotted the temperature as heat was added at a steady rate through time. The interesting thing is, if we did that, we would not get a nice linear graph. What we would get is this kind of stair-steppy graph. And quite honestly, I used to do this experiment with some of my students. Um, I stopped doing it because it was so boring. It was like watching paint dry. You were, it took an hour and we were watching water boil. Um, but it was really cool because we got a graph that looked very, very much like this. There's a lot of really nifty information in this graph. And so we're going to begin by, I'm going to ask you to actually draw this graph. So here goes. On the y-axis, I want you to put temperature. On the x-axis, this is going to be time with added heat. So again, imagine that you started out with a bucket of cold ice or cold snow. Let's say we started at about minus 20 degrees Celsius. And we're only going to add a couple temperature points here, um, 0 degrees Celsius, the freezing point of water, and then 100 degrees Celsius, the boiling point of water. If we graphed the temperature of this every few minutes over time, this is the shape of the graph that we would get. And we're going to draw in this picture. So if you're taking notes, do this with enough room so that you can do a good job of this. Okay, and then it's going to flatten out again, about 100, and then it's going to keep going up. All right, so up at a steady rate, flat at 0, up at a nice steady slope between 0 and 100, flat again at 100, and then up again. Now, here's what's happening. During this first upward portion, you are dealing with solid, and we're talking mostly about ice here, so this is going to be solid ice. In the upward slope in the middle, we're going to have a liquid. And then in the far upper portion, we're going to have a gas or a vapor. Now, as the slope rises with added heat, that means that we are going to be changing the kinetic energy of the molecules. So when you change the kin internal kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance, you're affecting its temperature. So its temperature is going up. If we had to calculate the heat needed to do this, the equation would be m for the mass, c for the specific heat of the solid we're talking about, and then the change in temp. So that would be just the change in temp within this portion. It would stop being a solid right there. Now during the flat portion here, the temperature is not changing. And because temperature is not changing, we're not changing kinetic energy. We are going to change the internal potential energy. And if we had to calculate the heat, we would have the quantity of heat would be latent heat of fusion times the mass of my substance. And what I'd be dealing with, honestly, would be a mixture of solid plus liquid. It would be in that phase change. It was melting or it was freezing in that section there. The next upward section in the middle, again, temperature is going up, so we're going to change the internal kinetic energy. If we had to do calculations, the heat would be equal to mass, specific heat of the liquid involved, and the change in temp, and we'd only use this part of the change in temp we needed in order to do the calculation. The next flat portion up here, it's a change in potential energy, and it would be latent heat of vaporization times mass, and we would have at this portion a mixture of liquid plus gas. And in the last upward portion, again, temperature is going up, and so we're going to have a change in kinetic energy, and the heat necessary to do that would be mass 
specific heat of the vapor or the gas and the change in temperature we're talking about. This picture is a big deal when we start doing some math problems in the next video. Um, I'm going to refer back to this all the time. But before we get to math, I want to talk about what this graph shows us. Some of the things we've discussed before. One of the things it talks about is the cooling effect of evaporation. So if you've got a liquid and it's going to a gas, Heat has to be added. Heat is added from that liquid to the gas because time heat addition is going in this direction. So heat has to be input to go from a liquid to, to, get, to a gas. Why is this handy? Well, this removes heat via perspiration. This removes heat via evaporation for one of these cooling wraps. You get a shot that feels cool. If you have a swamp cooler or, or an evaporative cooler, it is going to remove heat via evaporation that way. And it's this section of the graph, graph that shows us that. Heat is also released by condensation. So let's say I've got gas and I'm going down to a liquid. We're taking the same portion of the graph, but we're going in the opposite direction. If I have gas molecules and I'm going back down to a liquid, heat has to actually go in the opposite direction, and heat is actually going to be released in this situation. What I'm talking about is most of us on a beautiful summer day have laid out and watched a thundercloud build. And I want to explain how that building process occurs. But before we do that, I want you to do me a favor. If you can, would you please just right now breathe out? Okay, just go and breathe out. Now, if you breathe out along with the carbon dioxide you're exhaling, you're also ex exhaling some water vapor. And my question is, is the water vapor clear or is the water vapor white like a cloud? Try it again. Is it clear or white? Well, it's probably clear, not unless you're watching video someplace that's really, really cold. So what that means is when you see a cloud, when you see water in a cloud form, that is actually liquid water. Why is that a big deal? Well, vapor is clear, and it's non-visible gas, but these are tiny little droplets of liquid water that are surrounding little particles of dust in the atmosphere and are suspended by the buoyancy force of the air around it. So how actually does one of these big thunderclouds get formed? Okay, in a nice hot afternoon, you may have noticed if you were laying out that there are a lot of pretty little cumulus clouds that are about the same altitude. Most of the time in the atmosphere, it's hotter near the ground and it's cooler as you go up. Now, the bottoms of the clouds typically are just all about the same altitude because what that means is it, it has gotten cold enough at that elevation for liquid water to go from, or from water to go from a gas to a liquid state. And it has to be liquid in order to turn into a white fluffy cloud. Now, when it goes from a gas to a liquid, heat is released. So when heat is given off, as you know, hot air tends to rise. So the heat given off by the condensation of the water creates an updraft. Hot air rises, cold air falls. And so this causes air to move up. This pulls more air in from down below, and it goes to higher elevations where it's colder. What happens? At a higher elevation, the water condenses and it releases heat. So that means it builds up that creates more of an updraft. It goes to a higher elevation, it cools, it condenses, and it releases heat. The process keeps going again and again and again and again until you get these massively tall thunderstorms and then a cold front or a, or a uh, yeah, I, something blows over, warm front blows over the top, and you get these big anvils. There are massive updrafts and downdrafts inside of big convection currents, inside of thunderstorms, and a rain droplet's going to go up and down many, 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 many times until there is not enough buoyancy force inside of the cloud, and then it lets loose and they start falling down as rain. 
if a little droplet goes from here up and down many, many times, it can accumulate a coating of ice, and that ice coating gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then you end up with hailstones. Heat is also taken in as a liquid boils. So let's say you have a liquid and you want it to go up to a boil. Well, on the graph, you're going from here to there. But the thing that's interesting is, see this plateau right there? That plateau means that once you get a pan on the stove boiling, if you increase the 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 rate at which it's boiling, you turn it up from medium to super hot on your stove, what it's going to do is you are going to add heat quicker, but you are not going to get any hotter because it's going, not going to get any hotter as long as it is a liquid boiling. Boiling temp is a set temperature and it is controlled by this whole latent heat process. So if you want some water to get to a higher temperature than boiling temperature, what you have to do is you have to prevent it from going into a vapor state, and that's what a pressure cooker or an Instapot does. It holds in the vapor, and that ups that boiling temperature. If you have a your favorite beverage and you have it on ice, once the beverage and the ice have reached an equilibrium temperature, they are going to, because here you've got your liquid, here you've got your solid. In this area, you've got a mixture of solid and liquid. As long as you have a mixture of ice and liquid, you are going to keep that drink at just that nice, refreshing zero degree Celsius temperature. It is not until all of the ice has melted that then it will continue to get warmer and warmer and warmer. So as long as you still have some ice in your glass, it's going to maintain that same temperature. Freezing releases heat. If you have liquid water and you want to keep something from freezing, I when I was growing up, my uncle ran a greenhouse and he was Every spring, once in a while, he was frightened of a frost killing his product and messing with his income, and he would run sprinklers all night long. And the idea is that there's so much heat in liquid water that as long as the sprinklers would run over the product, it would have all of this latent heat that would prevent the plants from freezing because all this heat had to be released as it went from a liquid down to a solid. There's a lot of nifty things about latent heat, Next time we're going to do some math problems with them, and I will see you then.